You know, what a lot of people don't know is that any number you've ever heard about police violence comes from the aggregate of media reports. So if you get killed in this country and a newspaper doesn't write about it, it's not covered on like a blog or like a TV or something, you literally don't exist in the data set. The federal government doesn't collect information about police killings in any systemic way. We can tell you the rainfall in Missouri in 1830. We can't actually tell you how many people got killed, like is a hard fact. Uh, last year, we don't know it. What we know is like the aggregate of media reports. These incredible activists years ago set up these two big databases that essentially called like a advanced Google alerts of like police killings. And that is the source data for everything that you've ever seen around police killings. Uh, some of the biggest databases that you might have heard of are like the Washington Post database, um, the fatal encounters killed by police. We created Mapping Police Violence to create the single stop database that had the most comprehensive data about police killings. If you think about the Washington Post database, for instance, they only have uh, killings by officers on duty that use a gun. So say for example, an officer goes home and runs somebody uh, over with their car, like that's not counted. Say somebody's on duty and the officer runs you over with their car, not counted. Eric Garner's death is not in the Washington Post database. Why? Because he wasn't killed with a gun, right? So we wanted to say that like, whether you got killed by a taser, a chokehold, whether the officer was at home and like killed his wife off duty, we consider all of those to be uh, symptoms of the same sort of root problem. So that's why we created the database. And what we know is that left to their own devices, the police will just never report this data. There are times where like the state of Florida has reported zero police killings in the entire in entire spans of years. And you're like, well, we know that's not true. Like we can just look at the news and say it wasn't zero, right? Uh, so the data actually is really important for us to help locate what the problem is and what the solution should be. And the last thing I'll say is that we have to figure out how to start talking about police violence beyond death. So we know that the police inflict, uh, inflict damaging communities in ways like uh, sexual assault, like verbal abuse, those sort of things. And the data we, we have most readily available is about death, but because we only focus on death with the data, we're losing how the police impact uh, women, how the police impact LGBT communities, like any other ways that don't result in death but are still really bad. And we have to figure out how to do that. One of the limitations is that most police departments definitely don't make that data publicly available or don't collect it in any systemic way. So you think about police departments like Baltimore where so much of the data was on paper and you're like, well, you know, who's sitting down analyzing 10 million records on paper? Nobody right now. And that becomes like a challenge. So what we found were a couple myth busters. We found uh, things like, there's this idea that community violence and police violence are related. So in communities where, they're just, where there's just a lot of violence, people say that the police just have to be there because the communities are violent, so the police must be there. And because the police must be there, it's just more likely that they'll probably engage in violence against communities. And we found is that that's just not true. There are places where there's a lot of community violence and almost no police violence, and the, and the inverse is also true, that there's no real relationship between community violence and police violence. What we also found is that black people are actually more likely to be unarmed than any other race of people uh, who are killed by police. So there's this myth that like black people are just carrying guns around and like they're in the presence of the police. And that actually isn't true. Uh, and with regard to policy, we found out a lot of things. So we created the first public database of use of force policies and police union contracts in the country because we were trying to figure out like why are the police not accountable? Is it really that uh, prosecutors and mayors just don't care? Like what, what is the what? And what we found is that there's literally just a different justice system. So you think about places like in Maryland. In Maryland, the law literally says that an office, that a citizen can file an anonymous complaint against an officer for everything except brutality. And you're like, I don't even know what that means. In California, uh, there's a law that says that any investigation of an officer that lasts more than a year can never result in discipline. You're like, I don't even, I don't know what that means, right? Uh, in places like Baton Rouge, you can't file a complaint over the phone against an officer. There are places where you have to file, you have to file an affidavit. It's like, where would you go to get an affidavit today? I don't know, right? Like, there are all these things that almost guarantee that officers won't be held accountable, and we shed light on them for the first time with this big database, trying to help people see, like, it actually, you could get a great prosecutor, but if the rules are, are set up against everybody, the great prosecutor is still hamstrung. You can get a mayor, you can get a city council, but if we don't focus on these structural things that aren't necessarily the most sexy, but they're actually the most salient in terms of outcomes, like, we'll never win. And that's why we created Map and Police Violence to get the data and then Campaign Zero to talk about like the policies and solutions that actually might change the system of accountability. Yeah, so we made the first public database of use of force policies in the country, and it was hard to get. Use of force policies, for people that don't know, are essentially the rules that police use to say whether they can use force against somebody. 
anything up to and leading to death or murder. And what we found is that A, it was just really hard to get the record. So we, our data set right now is the 100 biggest cities in the country. In some places sent us back almost entirely redacted policies. Some places uh, after a long battle, we got them. And what we found are a couple of things. One is that, uh, one of the things that we look for is like, do you ban chokeholds, right? We, we know that there are almost no instances where like it makes sense for an officer to restrict somebody's airway. We also found that there's some slipperiness that happens. So New York City is a great example of like, chokeholds are banned in New York City. Eric Garner, the police would say, was not put in a chokehold. He was put in a stranglehold. And strangleholds aren't banned in New York City. And you're like, well, people experience them all the same. He still died, like he died, you know? So we map that across uh, places. We also map, is there a continuum of force? Like, is there like an officer has to like use a verbal warning, then use something else and da da da. There are a lot of places where there actually isn't a continuum. It's sort of like just use force. And you're like, well, that doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, we also map to look at, can you shoot in moving cars? What we find is that like, when you look at the data, the police would have you believe that they respond, that they're always responding to bank robberies. Like every single 911 calls a bank robbery and that the data actually just doesn't support that. So when you see some of the stuff that is leading to these car chases, it actually just isn't worth the collateral damage. It's not worth somebody getting shot, their leg still being on the gas and them running pedestrians. Out. Like it's just, none of it's worth it, especially in a time where like there are helicopters. Like if you wanted to find that person, you're probably gonna find them. So we should ban shooting into moving vehicles. Like we, we are mapping all of these things so that we can say to departments, A, we know that there's a problem in your city because we have the data on police violence. B, there's structural things that you can actually change that statistically suggest that they'll have a better outcome in those places. So we map them. Does your partner have to intervene if they see you using force unnecessarily? We think that they should. Like, do you have to engage lesser force before you use lethal force? We think you should, right? Like, and you know, we're up against a system that's really challenging. The police for decades have been taught something called the 21 foot rule. I don't know if you've ever heard of the 21 foot rule, but they get trained that if somebody is, is if somebody is within 21 feet of you, they could kill you. That's like the rule that they get trained. So it's like, so you're like, well, why did you shoot the guy with the knife? And they're like, oh, we were trained that if they're within 21 feet of us, they can run quick enough to kill. And you're like, who is making this stuff up? And like, it's been disproven. It's like crackpot science, but those things are actually like really dangerous. And we wanted to say, what are the policies and solutions that either lead to these outcomes or that we could change? Mm -hmm.